Oh, so you think it's okay to call women unhinged? You think it's okay to call a woman crazy? Me too. Prudes get pussy. Bitch, life is vulgar. Where the fuck have you been? Welcome back to my channel, Prudes. My name's Charles, and I'm a misogynist. Today we're talking about crazy broads. That's right. If you're looking for a healthy dose of misogyny, if you're looking for the rundown on unhinged, balls-to-the-wall, nuts, ape-shit, crazy women, you've come to the right place. Sorry, that was all redundant. We're just talking about women today. Cheers. Fuck. Sorry I zoned out, I was staring at your eyes, they're beautiful. Did I mention I'm famous? I feel like I should lead with that so you don't get the wrong impression thinking we're friends or some imbecile shit like that. Did you notice my shirt? It's purple. I'm wearing it because purple is every woman's second favorite color. Pink being the first, of course. Let's talk about books. Let's talk about books. Today we're talking about books. Um, this video will be spoiler-free. I'll be talking about the details of the books, but more like broad stroke than anything. So if you want to read them, you can without them having been spoiled, so don't fret. I've got you. I can't decide if I should call this book Madame Bovine or Madame Ovary or just get a sense of humor. It's like a week later. <laughs> Welcome back to my channel. I'm not sure where editing me is gonna cut off the last portion, the first portion, whatever, of this video, but I was all over the place. And it got to the point where I was just saying vapid shit on camera and then giggling to myself and I was like, Charles, you need to calm down. Charles, this isn't gonna cut it. So here we are, take two, cool, calm, collected, and a little less cucked. Cheers. To my day-old Starbucks coffee. I'm keeping the old intro for the chaos, but this part of the video is a veritable 2.0. Also, the thumbnail picture is from weeks before I even filmed the first clip for this video. So this video has been in the works and devolving for quite a while now. Also, we're gonna try streamlining this video. Buckle up, no big deal. I'm gonna switch it up and try and cut down on the video length. First of all, because it's obscene to be posting hour and 20 minute length feature films. A couple of you recommended I put my last video on Letterboxd and don't worry, I'm working on it. But in this video and in future videos, we're gonna try and cut down on length. I don't know how that's gonna go, but I wanna read more, post more, and edit less. For longer thoughts, maybe I'll like write essays or do a book club or live streams or some stupid shit like that. IDK, baby. I'll keep you posted. We're starting with my favorite of the three books I read for this video. That is The Days of Abandonment by Elena Ferrante. Before we start chatting, a moment of silence so I can collect myself and not start spewing gleeful bimbo shit. Okay, I'm ready. This is a perfect book. It's gorgeous. It's fucking gorgeous. I haven't read many perfect books. A lot of my favorite books of all time are flawed. The Days of Abandonment is not. It's a first person narration by a mother whose husband has left her for a much younger woman, and it's brilliant. It's clever, comical, bleak, funny, incisive, vulgar, earnest, down to earth. And it's comical not in a forceful, cringy, jokey way, but in a life itself is comical way. Life is a fucking prank as is, and Ferrante gets that. The book kind of reminds me of the Scream movies, like the horror movies, or at least the first couple, in that the days of abandonment indulges in the comedy of abandonment hysteria, but remains an earnest, serious portrait of abandonment. I guess all strong emotions are Scream-esque in their banal but earnest and therefore comical nature, but Ferrante conveys that better than any author I can think of right now. And the writing is incredible. Like, each sentence is a marvel. The book is skinny. It's less than 200 pages, and it took me forever to get through this book because I would read a sentence and I would be like, damn. 
damn, 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 damn. And then I would read over it again, or I would pause to think about it. Like each sentence truly packs a punch. There is no fat in this novel. Ferrante also nails the BPD vacillating moods and uncertainty of being in a drowning relationship. And more broadly, that of being in any life-changing situation. We're gonna end on a quote one quote because I'd be going damn crazy with the quotes and I need to stop beating you guys upside the head with them because that's just not the move and we're streamlining these days. No big deal. <laughs> so here's my favorite quote. It's a bit of a doozy, a little lengthy, but it's a banger and here it is. As a girl I had fallen in love with Mario, but I could have fallen in love with anyone, a body to which we end up attributing who knows what meanings, a long passage of life together, and you think he's the only man you can be happy with. You don't know who he really is, he doesn't know himself. We are occasions. We give it a name, that desire of the cock. We personalize it, we call it my love. So savage. So savage. She knows how to write. Pretty cool. No big deal. And it's like every page is filled with these impressive, breathtaking, super hard-hitting quotes, which when I was planning this video, I was like, I'm gonna read every single one. And then I was like, pump the brakes, Charles, be cool, be cool, be fucking cool. And here we are. Look at me, reading one quote. Okay, I'm gonna read another one, but only two, I promise. Okay. Here it is. Because what is the face? What finally is the skin over the flesh, a cover, a disguise, rouge for the insupportable horror of our living nature? Eat me, Elena Ferrante. Eat me. Eat me. Every line is of anger. You need to read this book ASAP and LMK what you think. Also, I read this book with Nathan and Kieran, two sexy YouTubers who also talk about books from time to time, no big deal. They're awesome. I'll link their channels in the description below. Give them a click, don't be a prude. <laughs> Shut up. Did we really just get through that? Cut that, Charles. We're streamlining. Next up is Death in Her. I think the common refrain of my videos is going to be that I just had six coffees and an energy drink and I'm sweating and I'm feeling a little tweaked out. What can you do? Next up is Death in Her Hands by Otessa Moshvig. I've also read My Year of Rest and Relaxation and Eileen, and I think both are a blast, particularly My Year of Rest and Relaxation. I think about that book a lot, and it's super funny and smart and clever, and it's just so much fun. It probably should have made it into my favorites of all time video. If I ever do an updated video, it would probably be in it. Anyway, I really like Death in Her Hands. It's a first person narration of a 72 year old woman who finds a note in the woods that says a woman has been killed. Side note, no. Cut. And the book follows the narrator's attempt to unravel the mystery of the dead woman. In typical Moshveg fashion, the narrator's voice is funny, abrasive, bizarre, lonely, and uncertain. Side note, if you've read any of Moshveg's books, particularly more than one of them, you'll know what I mean, but her voice is very piquant, so I wouldn't recommend binging her books, but if you space them out, you're in for a treat because they're all fun as hell. They're also pretty substantive, which is why I love them. Well, I love them because they're a blast, but them being substantive is a nice plus. Um, Death in Her Hands is the most substance e book of Mosh Fakes that I've read, and it was great. If I had to describe this book in one word, I would say schizophrenic in a hot way. I think people have pretty different thresholds for what they consider a spoiler, so I don't want to be too too specific because I have a really low threshold like when I'm reading a book if I don't want to hear anything about it like just tell me it's good and if I trust you I'll read it but I don't want to be like oh it's so sad it's like okay well then someone probably dies or whatever relationship or friendship or the central conflict turns out in a bad way. Like, you can really read in easily to what some people perceive as broad critiques of a book. I'm gonna try and be broad. I'm gonna try and shut up more. But this book made me think about 
reality? Like, what does it mean for something to be real? What distinguishes fiction from reality? And what's so clever about the book is that it forces you to consider these questions by itself being so tacitly meta. There's the book's real storyline, there's the book's made-up storyline, then there's in all fiction the books themselves are not real, and then there's the fact that all fiction is real by virtue of it being written and thought up by a real person with real thoughts. I know that sounds confusing and a bit stupid, but that's kind of the point and the beauty of the book. It sends you into a bit of a mental tailspin when you try and draw a line between fiction and reality. I guess what I'm trying to say is we're all fake bitches with real feelings. I think if you don't pay attention closely, you could write this book off as unremarkable, annoying, and stupid, but it's actually very clever and very fun. I see some pedestrians. I think you should read this book, but do so vigilantly. Take your time. Be cool. Be calm. Don't rush. And you might have a blast, like I did. Lastly, and this goes for all of the Mosh Fig books I've read, I love how not PC she is, especially in her bodily descriptions of characters. It's refreshing because life isn't goddamn PC, and I hate when authors filter reality or character dialogue or character thoughts through how they think a character or person should think and act versus how a character would actually think and act. It's awful. I hate the PC lens to literature, and I love that Mosh Fig pushes back on it. It's also very funny that people criticize Mosh Fig for being graphic and base when literature that filters reality through a like rose tinted lens or whatever is itself actually very cynical because the implication is that anyone who deviates from that gold standard of like morality is like wrong and stupid and ugly and should burn in hell which is like so i love mosh fig and i'm happy that she's as popular as she is she's awesome on to madame bovary did i say that oh. on to madame Bo on to on to madame bovary madame bovary okay that's it on to madame bovary Don't say it, don't say it, don't say it, don't say it, don't say it. Okay, Diet Anna Karenina, go off. I wanted to love this book so bad, mostly because the cover is hot as fuck, but also because some authors and people I really respect and admire love this book, but I didn't. So we're not gonna spend too much time talking about it. I thought on the whole, it was fine. Some of the lines are absolute bangers, What was I saying? Some of the lines are absolute bangers, but boy, did Flaubert know how to house bangers in a boring ass book. So much of this book is so, so dry. Flaubert does this thing where he tangents off into the life of a side character or some description of a place, and it's mind-numbingly boring. And Tolstoy does it too in Anna Karenina, but Tolstoy's tangents feel much less superfluous to the storyline, and for me, add to the, like, not only aesthetics, like the overall picture of the novel. Like, there's um, a scene in Anna Karenina where it's just Levin cutting grass with a scythe, and I think about that scene, like, at least once a week. And for some people it's like really, really boring, but I think it adds to the overall impression of the book and contributes to the development of the themes. But Madame Bovary I found incredibly boring and I hated the tangents. Despite being called Madame Bovary, a very significant portion of this book is just irrelevant to her character arc. I thought Emma, Madame Bovary's first name, was annoying and whiny and stupid. And to be fair, I did think that of Anna Karenina at one point when I was reading it, but it was a fairly brief period. But she redeems herself and I end up loving Anna Karenina by the end. I didn't feel that way with this book. 
But I did enjoy Emma's parts, Madame Bovary, whatever. I enjoyed her parts the most, and some parts I was like really hooked. It's a big yikes that Anna Karenina was written 20 years after Madame Bovary was, and they're very similar, but Anna Karenina is way better. Anna Karenina is a win for innovators everywhere. I don't think you should read this book. Just read Anna Karenina and move on. At most, just go on like Pinterest or some shit and scroll through artsy little quotes from the book because some of the quotes are really good. My critique of Madame Bovary being that I didn't like it overall, what did I say? It was fine like 30 seconds ago. My review is devolving. Um, I, I, I just didn't enjoy reading this. I got a headache so many times. <laughs> during this book, it's like a very large reason why this video wasn't out sooner because I would just like get this awful headache trying to focus on something I didn't want to be reading, which some people might be like, buck up, like don't be a pussy, learn how to read. But like if you don't enjoy a book, like the reading experience, you don't really need any more reason to say you didn't like it. Enjoying the process of reading a book is not a quality that should be undervalued by any stretch. And I know it's not, or at least it's it's not undervalued in children's books, but when you get to like classics and older literature, I don't know, just like uh, when you grow out of childhood, I think there's this belief that prioritizing your enjoyment while reading a book is childish. It's not. Get a grit, bitch. You should enjoy the books you're reading, otherwise like, I get reading a boring book and coming away with some sort of edification, but that wasn't this book for me. There were some banger lines, like I said, but it didn't change my life. The only books you should be slogging your way through are ones that will change your life, and those books are very few and far between. So read books you like. Read books you enjoy. Anyway, I was saying my critique of Madame Bovary touches on a gripe I have with a lot of classics. That being, I think they're just fine. I think parts are really good, and I think you'll get something out of every classic. But then again, you get something out of even the shittiest of books. So when I say a book isn't worth it, isn't worth reading, I don't mean the book is worthless. I mean that I think there's a negative opportunity cost between reading the book I don't recommend and reading other books, another book. Also, you should take recommendations within the scope of your reading history, which kind of goes without saying, but like if you've read Anna Karenina, then maybe Madame Bovary is the right choice for you. But then at that point, you've already had the best of smart, unhinged, adulterous women. So why trifle with second bests? Read some sci-fi. Read some Colleen Hoover. We don't have forever, babe. You gotta pick your battles, and this isn't one I'd pick again. Side note, this translation is fantastic if you want to read it. Bitch. I'm just kidding. Read it if you want. This translation is uh, by Adam Thorpe. I side by side compared a page of this book with a page from a different translation, and the other translation was clunky and old and dusty and less cutting in its prose. So if you do want to read an edition of Madame Bovary, I really recommend this one. Not just because the cover's hot, but the translation's really good. From my brief reconnaissance. If you love this book, I respect the hustle. I love parts of it too. But in addition to thinking so much of this book was boring, is boring, the melodramatic tone that coats pretty much the entirety of the book quickly became daunting and I hated all the characters. Not in a love to hate Game of Thrones Lannister way, just in a, oh, these characters are boring as shit and annoying way. Another side note that made me giggle is how many times something was described as voluptuous. It felt like every other page. And by the fifth time, I was like a little confused. I was like, am I tripping? Or has this word been used like a billion times already? I was scratching my head like an eight. But by the end, I realized Flaubert just had a fetish for curvy women. Let's end on a high note with a quote that made me laugh out loud. This is on page 178 of this book. Uh... <laughs> From a life spent with animals, she had taken on their dumbness and their placidity. Amen. Goodbye and good night.
Just kidding. That's it for the books I read for this video. Let's do a synthesis conclusion section where we talk about some similarities between the books. Okay, good, let's do it. Most importantly, there are characters in both Madame Bovary and Death in Her Hands who share my namesake, which is really cool because I love to navel gaze. Um, actually, there's one character and one dog with my namesake, but... Which brings us to the next similarity. That being that dogs are prominent in two out of the three books I read for this video. I think pointing out the irony of dog prominence in relation to this video concept would be in poor taste, so I won't do it. Okay, that's it. Bye. Thanks for watching. See you soon. Fuck. <laughs> Fuck. Money on the younger kids, and you won't get it. Just as long as you don't beat me again. <laughs>